episode of Science Simplified only on Bharata First. Through this platform, we provide you a unique opportunity to ask questions related to science and technology, which will be answered by our experts. Let your curiosity out and ask questions through a form whose link has been provided in the description box below. Do make use of this opportunity. Now, I would like to introduce to a science expert, Dr. T.V. Venkateshwaran, who is here with us to answer questions which were sent to us by our viewers last week. Dr. T.V. Venkateshwaran is a senior scientist at Vigyan Prasad, New Delhi. He is also founder editor of The Science Wire India. His area of research includes science, technology and society. He also writes regular columns related to developments on science and technology. So, the first question for today is... Hello sir, I am Ajit Kumar Kuswaha. I have done my graduation in BSc Mathematics Honours from Magad University, Bodh Gaya. And now I am preparing for UPSC Civil Services. My question is, what is Iron Dome? How it, it can enhance the military might of India? Is there any defense technology similar to Iron Dome except the ongoing procurement process of S-400? Thank you. Let's uh, first look at what is this Iron Dome. Iron Dome became famous uh, because of the recent uh, uh, skirmish between Israel and uh, Hamas uh, in uh, Palestine. Uh, the occupied Palestine and uh, Israel uh, when there was uh, missile attacks, okay, so the Iron Dome came into picture. So there were television uh, uh, which showed that how uh, the Israel was able to uh, detonate the uh, incoming missiles uh, by uh, firing uh, uh, counter missiles. Okay. So how does the Iron Dome work? Uh, suppose if there is an enemy missile that is uh, launched towards uh, your uh, area. So then uh, enemy rocket is fired, okay. So then uh, your radar system, you have a radar system which detects, okay. So this radar uh, estimates the uh, pathway, direction and so on. And then uh, that goes to a control system. The control system estimates what will be the path taken by the uh, uh, missile and so on. And then it gives a command to a launcher, okay, uh, intercept missiles, okay. So these intercept missiles are launched. So they are launched in a, a projectile which will exactly meet this at a point, at a safe distance. Okay? No, it should not be on your uh, uh, country's uh, territories, head, right, etc. Right? So it has to be at a safe height and safe distance. So they are launched. So when uh, they come near, uh, when when uh, this intercept missile comes near the uh, incoming missile, the intercept uh, missile explodes and the uh, incoming uh, missile is uh, destroyed. Okay, so. That's what is called as iron dome. So it is not actually made up of iron. It's called iron dome basically because these are all largely uh, iron structures, right? You know, huge iron structures. So it looks like, uh, I mean, it gives a feeling like you are living inside an iron dome in which missiles cannot uh, fall. Okay, so this is what uh, the uh, uh, iron dome. Uh, India uh, has a number of uh, missiles to uh, protect its. Uh, uh, border from being attacked. One of them is uh, uh, Baraki. Okay. It's a long range surface to air missile. Okay, so it was uh, successfully uh, test fired from uh, Balasur uh, in Urissa. So it is uh, inducted into our uh, 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 position. The uh, second one is this uh, S 400 that uh, uh, Indian defense system is acquiring from Russia. Okay, so how does that work? So basically, there are uh, surveillance radar which can identify target which are at uh, 600 kilometers, not near, just nearby, 600 kilometers, okay? So it can identify the target. So that target information goes to the uh, command center, okay? So then the command center uh, calculates and then uh, decides how, uh, uh, okay, uh, uh, that which one should be attacked first, uh, what is the sequence and so on. That's uh, sent to a control uh, unit. Okay, so this control unit directs the missiles which are uh, launched from the missile so that this missile can be guided. So these missiles are not just fired, they can be guided on its way. When, when it is uh, flying, when this object uh, changes its direction, you can also make the missile change its direction. Okay, so uh, you can make it go behind. 
so that's what the uh, uh, russian is uh, 400 uh, system so something similar to i and o but slightly different i mean here we are looking at a long range we are not looking at uh, near range india is a huge country and then uh, uh, you want a long range uh, uh, protection okay so if you look at the i and o and uh, uh, s 400 okay these are short range but these are as i said uh, uh, anti ballistic missile meaning that even uh, uh, intercontinental missiles which are coming toward uh, uh, india that is even if it is launched from 6000 kilometers away i'm sorry 600 kilometers away you can uh, uh, target okay so uh, uh, these are some of its uh, uh, specification uh, one is of course it's a short range and long range that i said if you look at the speed it's about uh, 4.8 kilometer per second okay so uh, something like about uh, uh, 11000 miles per hour but whereas here it is about 500 to 1000 miles per hour so which means that for short range this is okay but uh, in a long range if you uh, send a counter missile at this uh, low speed uh, before it can even reach the uh, uh, reach an intercept uh, i mean uh, 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 it will not give protection so you need a thing which can fly uh, very fast so s400 has that capability okay so this is what uh, uh, is uh, about uh, the uh, defense system that India is uh, uh, getting. India is not planning to get uh, Iron Dome at this point of time, basically because, as I said, it's short range. So India is looking at the uh, long range because India is a big country compared to this state. I'm Abhip Sharat and I'm a 12th grader. My question is, hydrogen is stated as the alternative fuel, but what are the problems associated with the leveraging of hydrogen fuel technology recently the uh, government of india had announced uh, uh, that uh, it is going to go in a big way for uh, uh, hydrogen uh, fuel uh, so basically one is uh, when when he talks about uh, hydrogen fuel uh, largely one is talking it for uh, uh, vehicles okay replacing uh, uh, petrol or diesel okay so you fill uh, hydrogen uh, tank in a highly pressurized manner so kind of it uh, gets uh, liquefied from that you uh, you can generate uh, uh, electric power uh, which you can also save in a battery in an electric car and then uh, you can have an electric car so uh, what happens in this is what is called as uh, hydrogen fuel cell so in the hydrogen fuel cell your inlet is hydrogen and uh, oxygen from air atmosphere atmosphere as uh, uh, oxygen okay so you put uh, oxygen from atmosphere and when you have an electrolyte in between, okay, so there is a movement of uh, hydrogen ion and uh, oxygen. And then uh, because of this movement, there is a, uh, a ionic movement, there is a, a field potential generated. This becomes uh, uh, negative, this becomes positive. So there is a, a, a potential difference uh, generated. So if you put a, a load, let's say, for example, a motor or a uh, battery for charging okay so the, there will be a circuit uh, uh, circuit happening and because of that you can get uh, motive power okay so you can get the energy out. so what will be the uh, uh, i mean uh, if you can say that in this operation what will be the uh, pollutant that will be coming out it will be water hydrogen will join with oxygen and uh, produce water so water is uh, nothing i mean it's not uh, unsafe right so no problem so important issue is how do you get hydrogen that is where the catch is. okay so how do you get the hydrogen okay one uh, you can use uh, uh, electric uh, power current and then uh, do something called as electrolysis that is you take water split it into hydrogen and oxygen so you get hydrogen and oxygen okay so both you can use right but then you'll be using electricity in a huge way. okay so that's uh, one uh, uh, important challenge the second is that uh, we do something called as a photoelectrolysis. So what do you do here? Uh, I use sunlight, use a solar panel to generate uh, uh, power that I use to do the electrolysis. So here I am using a green uh, energy source. Okay, so my uh, hydrogen is also green. But whereas in the earlier case it's not so because my uh, electricity is coming from a coal power. Now, people are also uh, uh, exploring, can we use biological methods? For example, there are some uh, uh, algae 
which uh, when uh, uh, exposed to sunlight uh, creates a photosynthesis in the photosynthesis you have hydrogen and oxygen so can i uh, do it in some kind of a controlled condition so that uh, through a biological method i can generate hydrogen and oxygen this is a question that uh, people are working on so this is a uh, uh, research is at the primary stage at this point of time okay so at present by and large people are thinking that uh, we will use a surplus of the renewable energy like say in the daytime when the sun produces uh, lots of energy uh, you are not able to use it or when the wind power is uh, very high you cannot uh, use it okay so at that time use this excess energy to uh, uh, do electrolysis create hydrogen and keep it hydrogen can be stored okay so that stored material can be taken anywhere so this is the idea that is uh, people are talking about about hydrogen at this point of time so when you finally come to a hydrogen uh, fuel car okay so you need a, a, a battery okay which uh, uh, which can uh, whenever that you are uh, applying brake okay but still the hydrogen uh, is combining with oxygen and producing water and electricity right so that electric power i mean you can uh, you change save okay the battery can uh, pick it up and then use it uh, at some point of time later when you want to uh, uh, speed up your car and things like that right so that time you can also use uh, right so you need a high pressure hydrogen tank okay you need a fuel stack uh, you need motor which can be driven by uh, electric uh, 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 generator okay so you need power control mechanism so you need a fuel cell uh, boost converter there are many areas which are uh, uh, which where new technologies are uh, required so that we can have a better uh, uh, functioning uh, hydrogen powered uh, cars okay so what are the pros and cons okay if uh, it's a greenest power source if your hydrogen is coming from green source okay uh, you can use renewable energy in uh, creating hydrogen it's a good efficient power source okay it's a quiet means i mean it doesn't make lot of sound or pollution okay so the fueling time is very short i mean very quickly you can uh, fuel the uh, hydrogen you can go for long range there is no harmful fume there is no air pollution there is no greenhouse gas emission these are all the pros now cost the cost of the car will be very high because now you need many many components okay from uh, batteries to hydrogen tanks to uh, uh, various things so the cost uh, would be high okay there will be a high depreciation in the first years meaning that uh, you, you bought with a high cost so when you take the fuel your return per kilometer if you compare it with let's say petrol or diesel may not be very high okay so uh, initial years there will be a high depreciation okay charging might be a issue for example can you get hydrogen everywhere okay can you handle hydrogen even in uh, small places because hydrogen uh, uh, if it explodes it's a problem right so uh can you handle so these are all uh, questions okay safety concern will be one important issue okay sometimes the hydrogen production may not be eco friendly if uh, you are relying on coal to generate hydrogen then your whole purpose is uh, defeated okay so these are all the pros and cons with respect to uh, hydrogen power hello my name is divyang damelia my question is what are novel virus and how they are extremely posing threat to human survival and how can we deal with them effectively in the context of the pandemic i mean this one question lot of us uh, have in our mind okay so uh, let's uh, look at how a novel uh, virus uh, or a pathogen comes in it may not be only virus here i am talking about virus but uh, it can be even pathogen but mostly they are all viruses okay uh, suppose if there are uh, some uh, virus in the uh, uh, animal okay but with the uh, host plasticity host plasticity meaning that it can move from one host to another host okay so from bat to rat to monkeys I mean if it can move okay so if it can move or there are right kind of vectors which can carry this uh, uh, viruses okay or it's in uh, animals with whom we are in close contact okay so domesticated animal cow chicken pig okay uh, all of them are domesticated animal they also carry uh, pathogens okay so what can happen is that when uh, uh, this situation occurs either uh, there is a lot of host plasticity or 
right kind of vectors are there or we are very closely interacting with those uh, uh, animals carrying these viruses there is something called a spillover can occur meaning that the virus can come into the human most of the occasion when it comes to the human that virus will not be able to reproduce it will not be able to survive so it will be dead but then it will not be only coming to one human right and it will not be coming only on one day right so it is going to come on every day it's going to come to many 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 uh, humans so randomly okay so suppose if i uh, 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 take a uh, playing cards okay randomly the top card can be a spade right not every time but once in a while it will be a spade right so like that a random event can occur sometime when the uh, uh, passing of this virus from uh, uh, this uh, zoonotic uh, uh, animals to human is spill over meaning that it is now able to survive in human and then uh, uh, reproduce once it is able to survive in human and reproduce then from human to human it will get transferred maybe by vector or directly okay if uh, malaria is transmitted by a vector dengue is uh, transmitted by a vector zika is transmitted by a vector but uh, novel coronavirus is transmitted from human to human so it can happen in both ways okay so there will be a amplification of human to human transmission once this uh, human to human transmission is amplified then what can happen is that it can go around the world okay it can go around the world so it can cause uh, uh, pandemics okay various kind of pandemics this is called as novel viruses okay so a virus which either two was not uh, infecting human has acquired uh, genetic change through uh, uh, mutation and is now able to infect human and spread from human to human either directly or through vector and uh, is uh, going around the world because it's a new virus none of us will have antibody for it so which means that all of us would be susceptible to that virus so a pandemic situation would be created okay so uh, how this uh, happens i mean it can happen in many ways okay uh, one way is for example there is a, a intermediary uh, host okay then from there it goes to the livestock okay so from the livestock i mean uh, it is uh, transmitted to human or there is a habitat uh, reduction because of that the wildlife are uh, moving into the uh, human uh, area and because of that i mean it can get transferred to the human so it can happen in uh, any of this fashion this spillover can happen in any of this fashion so if i look at uh, actually uh, world over uh, i mean as of now uh, historically what has happened there are a lot of domestic animals like uh, cow okay cat uh, uh, chicken okay so like that then there are uh, some what can be called as a peri domestic wildlife meaning that uh, it is not exactly domestic but it's peri uh, meaning that it uh, lives very uh, close to human being okay uh, uh, like say for example elephant elephant you cannot exactly say that it is domesticated right so it's somewhere in between you no know? so that kind of a thing. then there are also captive uh, uh, and managed farmed wildlife okay so you may be growing some wildlife in farm then there is free ranging wildlife okay so if you look at uh, what causes this spillover you can find that uh, the uh, free ranging wildlife is uh, really very small okay right so out of this 99% of uh, uh, spill okay infection occur directly or indirectly from uh, animal reservoir uh, clinical disease in human 99% is from domestic only 1% is from this uh, peri uh, domestic or captive or wild range okay so when you are talking about that when you talk about the uh, uh, emerging uh, infectious diseases diseases that we have been seeing in the near uh, past okay about uh, 28% uh, is from uh, uh, domestic and about 71% uh, is from uh, uh, the uh, wildlife uh, captive uh, 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 life etc like say for example hiv ebola uh, nile fever zika covid you know all these things are like this okay so then uh, uh, sometimes we can also infect uh, back to the animals okay don't think that only animals can infect us i mean we can also transfer viruses uh, to the animals so this is called a spillover so this kind of spillovers occur okay 
so this is what is called as novel uh, pathogens okay novel pathogens uh, which uh, uh, at times emerge because of our natural uh, living conditions the question has been asked what are defects and what are the issues that are associated with it in uh, today's world it's uh, one important emerging uh, challenge so deep fake is basically a fake but uh, done with uh, artificial intelligence earlier uh, we uh, would have heard about uh, 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 let's say uh, photoshopping right so you take a face photoshop it fix it in a different place and so on okay so that's faking that's faking right so now the deep fake is i use artificial intelligence to understand for example uh, how the face will fit and so on and so forth so now i am not cutting and pasting i am cutting and using artificial intelligence to paste and create a composite which is fake so i can do face swapping or facial manipulation that is i have a person i take uh, some facial uh, uh, information from some other uh, image i combine i change this person facial into something else okay so these are all two things which uh, uh, happen this happens not only in uh, still images it can also happen in moving images okay so you can make somebody talk okay so uh, these are all for example some examples of uh, deep fake okay so this is the original image so you have deep fake okay so you have got this all information and then you have uh, posted it for this particular face okay for this particular face using artificial intelligence similarly uh, here you have done that okay so you have a deep fake okay so you you are making the face move in a particular way so that the uh, person appears to talk something right so basically it's not only possible in uh, uh, still image it also possible in moving images so i have a input audio from that input audio i use a neural network to find out how the lips should be moving okay so based on that i make the uh, mouth structures change okay so use that and the, in the target video i change so in the final output it will be as if uh, barack obama is speaking this voice so you won't find uh, uh, the lip sync will be so clear that you will think that it is real so that is what is called as deep fake you can find a uh, uh, deep fake i mean if you watch carefully if you look for uh, signs like say for example there will be a inconsistent eye blinking for example this eye blinking and this eye blinking will not be synchronized if you keep carefully watch sometimes for example there may be mismatch the hearing okay here hearing is one way here the hearing is one way because you have taken from uh, uh, some uh, uh, image manipulation right so there may be so there may be some uh, uh, feature uh, uh, may be lacking so you might find that uh, uh, image bit strange it may not be exactly human like so these are all the things. so when you are talking about the risk there are uh, many uh, risk for example there may be a manipulation of civil discourse meaning that uh, you might create a small movie uh, which uh, like as if somebody is speaking but that person is not actually saying that but when it spreads to a large number of people people might think that such and such a person has said that right so uh, the uh, discourse will get uh, polluted okay so it may interfere with the elections and national security okay and uh, we may not trust a public institution and journalism we may think that maybe this is also manipulated right so there will be a mistrust huge mistrust developing in the society because of that it may harm individuals and firms right so some people uh, when you fake like this i mean their life career uh, uh, i mean with friends and relatives you know when they may uh, uh, it it or it can all get damaged it may also create false endorsement meaning that uh, some uh, some celebrity is uh, endorsing something but it's a deep fake so it's a false endorsement you no know? so that kind of false endorsement can happen that sometimes one can even think of uh, it can result in extortion uh, harassment uh, reputational damage okay so these are all various uh, uh, challenges 
uh, damages that uh, this uh, uh, can uh, pose to us. Okay, deep fake can pose to us. It's a really a important challenge. That is why many social media groups are engaged with it. Okay, so they want to develop uh, artificial intelligence system which can detect uh, deep fake. So if your image is manipulated, so a uh, highly manipulated image, then uh, automatically detect and then uh, 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 ban it or remove it from uh, the uh, circulation or warn that this is very highly manipulated and so on and so forth. Uh, uh, various uh, social media platforms are trying to engage this because there are a lot of people who are raising this concern that with the emergence of uh, artificial intelligence and being widely available, there is uh, all chance of such uh, uh, misappropriation of that technology for uh, wrong ends. Namaste, sir. My name is Sai Shri and I'm studying engineering final year. My question is, what do you mean by allelopathy and what role played by it in major cropping systems of irrigated agriculture? Thank you, sir. Important question. Again, uh, when, uh, now we are talking about uh, environmental concern where we are saying that uh, the agriculture as much as possible uh, should avoid uh, uh, unnecessary inputs. Okay, So we should try to do green agriculture. Uh, meaning that uh, as less as possible, we should use uh, fertilizers and uh, insecticides and so on. This is a new uh, uh, opportunity that comes before us. See, uh, what actually happens is that uh, plants do uh, emit uh, certain kind of chemical information, which is received by nearby plants and then they react to it. Okay, So in a sense, you can talk about uh, this as a uh, chemical communication between plants. So that's what uh, it is essentially. Okay. So how can this uh, happen? Uh, it can happen through four uh, methodologies, four uh, routes. There are four routes available. Okay. The uh, first route is that uh, it can uh, uh, emit the uh, chemical, which can be directly, uh, I mean, uh, emit the chemical to the uh, soil. So the soil, uh, through soil, that chemical is absorbed by the roots of the nearby plant. That is a one way. Second is, it can put some residue. Let's like say, for example, it's a leaf and so on. When it falls on the ground, when they decay, they may release the chemical, which then is uh, taken by the uh, plant. That is the second route. Third is, it releases a chemical. That chemical is not directly taken by the other plant. But this chemical uh, uh, induces, for example, soil bacteria to do something. Maybe emit chemicals or become active on the roots of the nearby plants and so on. Okay, like a switch on, switching on a, a system. Okay, so this is the third route. Okay, the fourth route is that it can uh, emit volatiles, that is uh, in the air, which can be uh, uh, sensed by the nearby plant and then the nearby plant can react. These are the four ways it can happen. Okay, uh, so uh, uh, this intra plant communication, you can uh, actually. Uh, have multiple effects. For example, sometimes the uh, uh, chemical that uh, are uh, excluded uh, have inhibitory effect, meaning that it uh, tells the plant not to grow or grow slow. Okay. Sometimes it may prime the defense that uh, there is a pest around. So maybe you put more metabolites in your uh, uh, leaf so that the uh, pest will not be able to eat right, or destroy uh, completely. Uh, so various ways the way plant can uh, uh, interact. Okay, so in agriculture, people are trying to find out whether this principle can be used uh, for what is called as bio agriculture. Okay, so basically you are using the knowledge of biology for doing agriculture. Till now we have used uh, chemistry for doing agriculture, like the fertilizers and uh, things like that. So now can we use the biological understanding? That's how it is. Uh, this, this new idea comes. In. So now look at this uh, two uh, fields. Okay, so these two fields. Okay, in the first one, okay, uh, the uh, uh, rye mulch precedes tomato crop. Okay, right. So the rye uh, mulch is uh, on the soil surface. Okay, because the rye mulch is on the soil surface, there is weed suppression. So weed does not grow here. Only the tomato plant is growing in this place where you have not put the rye mulch. Because the rye mulch uh, 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 excretes certain chemical, which inhibits the weed to grow in this place. Okay, so uh, 
you, now you don't need to use VD cycle. Here, for example, in the control uh, uh, plot, when they are trying to do this test, what they have done is that they have split the control uh, into two. In the left side, you have untreated. So you can see that the weeds are growing. This is untreated. In the right side, uh, you can see that uh, uh, you have used mechanical control by cultivation. Okay, So the tomato plants are growing well. So now you can see very clearly that uh, you can use, for example, rye mulch to control weed growth uh, in uh, tomato uh, cultivation in actual uh, life situation, okay? or at least in this particular soil. Uh, things may also change from soil condition to soil condition, but uh, that, that possibility exists. That's what uh, this uh, study shows. So this is uh, part of the uh, future uh, uh, vision of agriculture where we are looking at uh, doing agriculture with uh, less inputs which can uh, harm environment uh, like uh, chemical fertilizers and uh, pesticides and weedicides. Okay, so uh, this has a potential uh, to be used in uh, uh, future uh, bio agriculture that uh, possibly would emerge in the coming decades. Thank you, sir, for an insightful explanation of the questions. On this note, it's a wrap-up of today's episode of Science Simplified only on Bharata First. Be scientific, be inquisitive. Please like, share and subscribe to Bharata First for such amazing content. See you soon.